Over a decade ago, R&R meant a five-day escape from the mountains and the cold and the Chinese of Korea. And over a decade ago, that escape, R&R, went in one direction to Japan. Now R&R is an escape from here, Vietnam. But it goes in many directions. An R&R flight from South Vietnam can take you to Tokyo, or Hawaii, or Thailand, or you could end up in uh, Taipei, or in Malaysia. However, the r, r trip doesn't really start here at Tansanut, the busiest airfield in the world, but rather at a rather dusty and dismal place called Camp Alpha. Alpha is the staging area outside Saigon where thousands of weary GIs from every combat zone in Vietnam wash off the mud and the sweat, put on fresh uniforms, and process out for five days leave. In official jargon, R&R means rest and recreation, but to these men, it is a holiday from hell. After each man has spent at least three months in the swamp and jungle warfare of Vietnam, the R&R processing is routine, even boring. There are forms to fill out. U.S. military script must be changed into U.S. dollars. Boarding test and ID card. And there's the ubiquitous medic with his blunt needle. If you get the wrong shot, as this captain did, you write it off as service above and beyond the call of duty. The call of R&R &R is more important right now, and everyone at Camp Alpha is full of plans. Some have big plans and talk about them with a cockiness or a caution bred of war. What do you plan on doing in Taipei on R&R? &R? Oh, I don't know. He's mostly eating and sleeping, I guess. He's goofing off. You gonna spend a lot of money? No, I got about $300. I probably won't spend that much. I don't know. Sure. <laughs> probably so, though. What do you plan on doing on R&R? &R? I'll see the city, spend a little bit of money, I'll get drunk. Mm. Anything else? Well, I'll take a lot of pictures and try to call my parents at home. Um, on R&R, &R, I plan to visit all the bars and see all the good-looking girls in Taipei and uh, tour the city and see the great things that the uh, Chinese have got there and uh, spend maybe three or four hundred dollars and have a good, pretty good time. I figure anyway. What do you plan on doing on R&R? &R? Uh, just having a good time. A bit of a brag away from this. Can you be more specific? Oh, well, I could be specific when I might say it over there, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, just playing a bit of a rest, you know, a bit of a... What do you plan on doing? I'm planning on resting, that's for sure. What else? Uh, make a hog of myself, get drunk, I suppose. Keep up the uh, Australian image abroad. What do you plan on doing? I don't know, you're not there, but it'll be good, whatever it is. <laughs> After processing, it's a short ride from Camp Alpha to heavily guarded Tonsonut Air Base, where the R&R &R planes are waiting. Each GI has a free choice of cities on the R&R &R circuit. He lists them by preference, and if he's lucky, the Saigon military headquarters sends him where he wants to go. These GIs did not choose Hong Kong, or Tokyo, or Bangkok, or any of the better known watering holes of Asia. They chose Taipei, on the island of Taiwan and most of them think they chose Taipei for very good reasons. The plane waiting for them is a commercial airliner, but it's one no civilian can ride on. This one is part of a fleet of planes put together by Pan American Airways under a special R&R contract with the Pentagon. 
It is probably the world's largest commercial airline operation that is deliberately non-profit. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome on board our flight 648. On our flight between Saigon to Taipei, would you kindly fasten your seat belts and no smoking until we are airborne. In a matter of hours, when this plane does land in Taipei, that all too brief respite from war called R&R &R will begin. I'll be back with that part of our story in a moment. This is Taipei, Taiwan, the capital of nationalist China. It is off the beaten path for most American tourists, but in the past few months, Taipei has become a favorite R&R center for U.S. troops. It was only in January that nationalist China agreed to let American soldiers come here by the thousands. And now Pan Am's R&R shuttles are ferrying in several plane loads a week. At Taipei Airport, I asked Pan Am Vice President Tom Flanagan how the airline got involved in the first place. Well, about a year ago, uh, the military invited all the airlines to out to Scott Field to uh, bid on this operation. Our company was uh, very deeply involved in the Vietnam operation. We have something like 14 aircraft doing nothing but flying supplies from the West Coast out to Vietnam. The company thought that in return for business they were doing in that respect, they would like to contribute something of their own. So we bid on the contract. Do you think the company is sorry now? Oh, no, I think they're very happy with it. It's worked out very well for everybody. Now, you are in charge of the R&R &R operation, are you not? Yes, sir. How big an operation is it? Well, it's hard to, uh, there's various ways you can describe it. I mean, the geographical area that we cover, uh, would make it as large as a, any transcontinental airline in the United States. We have 13 DC-6s and uh, two 707s assigned full-time to it. How many so-called R&R centers are there? There are 10 in the southeast area region, and then we have Honolulu. Well, which one is the largest one as far as the number of people used? Well, right now it's Honolulu. Is there any special reason for Honolulu? <laughs> Well, I think the reason it's so popular right now is because the 25th Division, which is based in uh, Vietnam, came from Honolulu originally, and a lot of those boys are going back to see their families and wives. Mr. Flanagan, considering the considerable size of the R&R &R program today, do you think it's reached its optimum size or will continue to grow? Well, the, no, it'll continue to grow as the troop strength in uh, Vietnam goes up. It. Uh, started out when we took it over in March. We carried 5,000 approximately in March to R&R &R sites. By the end of 66, uh, we had carried a little over 100,000. And the uh, first three months of this year, we'll be carrying about 90,000. I think the projections for next year be in the vicinity of 400,000. That means that every man serving <coughs> in Vietnam, apparently, is going to fly on a Pan Am plane on R&R. &R. They're all entitled to, yes. After they're in the country three months, uh, every man in Vietnam is entitled to an R&R. &R. Well, considering all the money that Pan Am must be making on R&R, &R, it is a success? Well, on that money bit, uh, we're not making any money. The first four months, we did it for a total sum of $4, and we refunded to the government well over a million dollars, which we got into the contract. After the first four months, uh, we bid it on a no-profit basis, so there's no profit for Pan Am in it at all. Is there any intention to change that? No. Well, now you've mentioned 10 R&R centers now in use. Are there any plans for expansion? Well, they're always looking for new uh, areas as the uh, requirements go up, and uh, they are currently looking for other spots in Southeast Asia and probably in the South Pacific. Can you be specific about their locations or not? Uh, yes, we fly to Tokyo, Taipei, Hong Kong, Bangkok, and three places uh, south that uh, just soon not mentioned. Compared to Hong Kong and Bangkok, Taipei may not seem glamorous to the tourist, 
But like all teeming Asian cities, it has everything a weary veteran of the Vietnamese jungles could ask for. And some things he won't ask for. And everything it has to offer will be ready and waiting after dark when the latest plane load of GIs arrives. There's a minimum of formality as the GIs arrive, just an abbreviated immigration procedure. Then the troops are herded aboard a bus for a no-nonsense briefing by a Marine Corps sergeant who has seen everything happen too many times. Gentlemen, for your information, my name is Gunnery Sergeant Carlton, U.S. Marine Corps. I'm one of your six service representatives handling this R&R &R station. If you have any problems, you run into any difficulties while you're here, I want you to stop down the R&R &R center and we'll try to help you out. First off, security. Where you come from and what you've been doing is your own business. Keep it to yourself. It's nobody's business but your, your own. Incidents? If you get involved, any incidents out here, any incidents at all, while you're here in Taipei, on, on the island of Taiwan, you notify us at the r, &R Center or the Provost Marshal's office. We are equipped to handle it and get it out of the way quite quickly and quite efficiently. If you try to take care of it yourself, it's going to make it a little bit more difficult and we come out to help you. Your general conduct, I'm not going to go into detail on that. Gentlemen, you're all old enough to know how to conduct yourselves. Also, gentlemen, we got two types of girls here on the island. Look, we got the good ones, the bad ones, those that wear white socks, and those that don't wear any white socks at all. The first girl I'm going to tell you about wears a little triangular-shaped pin on her lapel. So you're going to meet her tonight out in the bars, and she's what we call a hostess. Now, gentlemen, this girl is, that's all she is, the hostess. She'll sit in the bar and she'll sit there and talk with you all night to the tune of one drink every 15 minutes to four drinks an hour. And it's going to cost you a bucket drink every time they drop one of those little tulips on her flat. Now, I'm going to tell you right now that she's going to probably drink more than one drink every 15 minutes. So you keep track of them, and if you don't want her to have them, you make sure that you tell the guy that's delivering this drink to her that you'll be the one that orders it to her when you get ready to order. Another thing, use the system out here, pay as you go. Don't let them build up a tab, because if you do, you're going to knock down anywhere from 50 on up to 100 bucks in that bar tonight. And before you know it, you're not going to know exactly where it went to. So if you use the system, pay as you go, you'll have no problem. The other little girl we got out here wears a little circular pin on her lapel. She's what we call a thoroughbred. And she's got plenty of practice. She's been in operation since January. And with the Chinese, she's been in operation a little bit longer than that. Now this girl, you'll find her out in the bar, and remember, she wears a little circular pin on her lapel. This girl can be hired out of the bar, and in order to hire her, you must sign a contract for her. Just like buying a car, rent a suit, or anything else that you might want to take out. These bars that we're telling you about are not off limits, and they are available to you. But if you go into them, I want you to watch yourself. We've had personnel spend a considerable amount of money there in one evening. And they give you a little sum around 375 for two people. These are the bars that I suggest you watch your money very closely. The OK Bar, the Casablanca Bar, the New York Bar, the Fox Bar, and specifically the Hong Kong Bar and the Playboy Bar. Now, if you go into these places and you find out that they're charging just a little bit more than they should while the sergeant talks, most of the GIs are taking careful note of every place they should not go and everything they should not do, as any sensible GI would. They tumble out of the bus at the American R&R &R Center in downtown Taipei, have their baggage checked by customs, and then receive chips for the hotels they will stay in. Outside the R&R &R Center, representatives of the hotels wait with what can only be described as eagerness. Yeah, we got a little more. Miami! Yeah, you going? <laughs> yeah, it's Miami. A scene that will repeat itself in every R&R &R city in Asia tonight. Asian hotels are noted for their service. On this, their first night on R&R, &R, it will be catch as catch can. And if the hotel representatives aren't as fast on their feet as the eager GI, the troops can be trusted to find their own way off limits.
found many of the GIs exactly where we expected them to be, in one of the bars the Marine Sergeant had warned them away from. The setting may seem a little unreal, like a hothouse, but after months in the stinking jungle of war, a little old-fashioned American overindulgence helps, even if the whiskey is watered and the music is too loud. And after some boyish awkwardness, a little conversation can do as much good as whiskey. Give her a kiss. Give her a kiss. Oh, it'd be nice. I'll give you a kiss. I don't know you. Who knows me? Nobody. I just got here to tell you. Hello. How are you? Fine. What's your name? Marvin. And you're not? Marge. Marge. Yeah, glad to meet you. I'm glad to meet you. Huh? Sit. How long have you been here? Oh, I got here Tuesday. Yeah, I've been here till Saturday. How long have you been here? Saturday. Saturday. You like Taipei? Yeah, I've been here for the second time I've been here. Yeah, I came Where? in uh, May 1966, and uh, I like it very much. It's very beautiful. Thing. Come back again. Some of these GIs will spend their whole R&R in &R bars, one end of Taipei to the other, until the taste of war has been completely drowned. It is in the back of almost every throat, even among the fuzzy cheek kids who've just had their first taste of combat in their first taste of R&R. &R. But others will find more to do than drink and talk here in Taipei and across the R&R &R circuit. And I'll be back in a moment with a look at some of the other sides of R&R. &R. On any afternoon in any R&R &R city in Asia, you will find a GI emerging from a bar, usually with a girl on his arm and a smile on his face. Not surprisingly, many of them have fallen in love, of one sort or another, and it will last or it won't last. At the same moment in time, you will find other GIs prowling the streets, hunting for presents for a parent or a wife or a child back home. Something exotic from a place that produces both exotic trinkets and exotic wars. In Taipei, as in other cities, East meets West in a peculiar fashion, on movie marquees or on billboards, adding to a strangeness that becomes more familiar every day. Delicacy served from familiar containers along the streets of Taipei may not be so familiar to the palate or too appetizing until you discover why they've been cooked that way for thousands of years. For the squeamish, or the wandering GI with a Japanese camera bought at the PX, there is that ancient Chinese culture breathing heavily in the crowded streets, smoking fragrantly in its carved temples, or hanging in delicate silk scrolls within the new National Palace Museum, the largest collection of Chinese art on Earth. Some of the GIs will find Beitou, a lush suburb of Taipei, and a colorful hangover from the decades of Japanese rule before World War II. Here, in what is now China, are some of the most popular Japanese inns in the Far East. Even highly paid Japanese businessmen fly to Taiwan 
to sink into the geisha houses of Beito for some tea, some conversation over rice wine, some sultry Japanese folk songs, or a bath in mineral water provided energetically by business-like girls. As the big pair of brogans at the door to an inn suggest, American GIs do find their way here, too. And it is just as relaxing and just as businesslike, despite the giggles in the geisha myth, as it would be for a middle-aged industrialist from Hokkaido. But for many of the GIs on r and neither the hectic pleasures of the city nor the artificial relaxation of Beito offers enough peace after months of guerrilla warfare in Vietnam. In search of complete solitude and complete quiet, some of them travel south, away from Taipei, into the countryside and the mountains of Taiwan. They are not disappointed, for this is one of the most beautiful islands on Earth. As plain tourists or as men running away from war for a mere five days, there is the almost infinite solitude and peace of Sun Moon Lake, where the silk scroll paintings of classical China take tangible form in every sunrise, in every sampan moving like a water bug across the dawn lake. Whether they go alone or not alone, the placid resorts in Taiwan's mountains provide the GIs with the closest thing to a holiday from hell that they're likely to find. But that hell and reminders of it are never far away. This is Asia, and in the omnipresent paddy fields of Taiwan, in the grunting water buffalo toiling through the paddies, even in the ageless turning of a water wheel. There are reflections of the peaceful countryside of Vietnam before night falls and the black-clad Viet Cong come out of hiding. Before the five days of r, &R really begin, they're over. And when r, &R ends, the war begins again. Out of the bars of every r, &R city, out of the soft hotel beds from Tokyo to Kuala Lumpur, out of the peaceful mountains and the lakes that make war and peace so much of a stark contrast in Asia, the GIs will file back aboard waiting aircraft 
to make their way wearily back to war, to the jungles and the swamps and the paddies of Vietnam. Some of the GIs will be going home in a few months. Others will not. 